In this video, we are going to discuss mastering the fundamentals of final tables. Whenever you are in any poker situation where you have some abnormal structure, you always want to ask what has actually changed compared to a structure where you can just simply use game theory optimal ranges. And when you're at a final table, you make money whenever you fold. Because whenever you fold, other people have the opportunity to go broke before you go broke. This is going to be especially true if there are a bunch of very shallow stacks at the final table and you have a medium or a big stack. So because you make money when people go broke, that's going to result in all the ranges changing substantially compared to when there are no payout implications, such as at the beginning of a tournament or in a cash game. And because of that, you cannot just pull up game theory optimal charts and blindly follow them because if you do that, you're going to be torching your money. So in this video, we are going to explain very clearly why that's the case. We're going to go through a bunch of strategic adjustments you need to make. And we're also going to go through some actual examples to show you how your strategy should be adjusted. So first things first, let's take a look at a very simple final table example to prove that you make money by folding. Suppose four people remain and each player has 25% of the chips. They have one fourth of the money each. Here are the payouts. First is $1,000, second is $700, third is $400, and fourth is $200. Since each player has 25% of the chips, you can very easily figure out how much each player's stack is worth. You just add up the remaining prize pool, which is $1,000 plus $700 plus $400 plus $200, divide it by four people, because that's how many people remain, and you'll see that each stack is worth $575. All right, what happens when two players get it all in with 50% equity each? Well. The player who wins ends up with $800 in equity, which you can solve using an ICM calculator. You can just search that on Google. It'll come right up. And the player who loses ends up with $200, which means half the time you end up with $800 in equity, and then the other half the time you end up with $200. So This means that when you and somebody else get it all in in this scenario with 50% equity each, you put in... 1,150 total, which is 575 times two, but you only get back $1,000. Well, where does that other money go? Where does that other $150 go? It goes to the two players who folded because they didn't get involved and they immediately get a payout jump. You may ask, why does the player who double up, who's doubled up not have more equity? And it's because first place is $1,000. And obviously you can't have $1,000 in equity when there are three players remaining because you're not guaranteed to take first place, even if you have 90% of the chips. And in this scenario, you only have 50% of the chips. So it's very important to realize that folding has value. So because ha folding has value at a final table, you want to ask who should be really trying to apply pressure on other players in order to make them fold. And as a broad generalization, when you have more money than the players remaining in the pot, you can usually be a decent amount more aggressive. And we're going to go through some examples so that you very clearly see this. The largest stacks can apply pressure to everyone because they're not concerned with going broke. If there are two large stacks, you may find that you can actually apply a decent amount of pressure to the other large stack because they really don't want to go broke. And while you also really don't want to go broke, a lot of the time people don't want to get in there and fight fire with fire. They just want to get out of the way. And if you can go from tied for first in chips to first in chips by a decent amount, then you can really run the table over. Medium stacks can apply pressure to other medium stacks and short stacks. The short stacks can only really apply pressure to other short stacks. Sometimes you should be the aggressor and sometimes you should be cautious. It's important to realize this and ranges will change a ton. You can't just think, all right, I'm in the cutoff with 40 big blinds at a final table. What should I do? because it really depends on the other stacks at the table. If you have 40 big blinds, three people have two big blinds, and the players yet to act all have 60 big blinds, you're going to be really, 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 really tight. But if you have 40 big blinds, a bunch of people have two big blinds, and the players yet to act all have 30 big blinds, so fewer than you, you are going to be overly loose, and that's important to realize. Also, sometimes you're going to be playing with various payout implications happening at the same time. Maybe the players yet to act have tiny stacks and huge stacks, and that's going to really convolute things. So we're going to be discussing those scenarios later in this video. Let's go through some broad concepts. If you want a full discussion on how to play final tables, check out 
my tournament masterclass and advanced tournament course at pokercoaching.com. We go very, very deep into these topics. I discuss a lot of these topics as well as some of the absolute best poker players in the world that I've hired to teach me and to teach you. All right, stack distribution is very important. If when you fold, the other players yet to act are likely to bust, not get busy, get busy and bust, your fold becomes worth more and more. So say you know the two big stacks yet to act are just absolutely insane and they're just playing to win. Well, you want to be even tighter. If you think they're going to be really cautious because they don't realize they're supposed to push around the final table, then maybe you can play a little bit looser. But as a fold becomes worth more and more money, you should play tighter and tighter. Also, the payout structure matters. All payout structures are not the same. Some are very top-heavy where first place gets half the money of the, in the entire tournament, and other structures are very, very flat where first may get only 15% of all the money in the tournament. And the flatter the payout structure, meaning the jumps between the current place and the next place, and the next place and the next place, etc., as the payout structure is flatter, the more bust outs are worth for you because you're not disproportionately rewarded for winning. It's a very clear example of this. Say you're playing a winner take all tournament. So first place is all the money. Well, now there are no payout implications. You should not be tight at all. You're just straight up playing to win and you can use game theory optimal ranges because that's what game theory optimal ranges presume. They presume that you're playing straight up for chips, which is what a winner take all tournament is. But that's not what regular final tables are. They have a payout structure. And because of that, when the payout structure is especially flat, you should be playing tighter. It's not fun to sit there and play tight and just be happy taking third or fourth place money. But quite often, that is the play that will result in you winning the most money on average. Not the most titles, but the most money. And I'm here to teach you how to win money. Next, the anti-size is important. I know in live poker, most tournaments today have a one big blind anti and uh, online, sometimes it's a little bit variable. Sometimes it's a little bit big. Sometimes it's a little bit small. In some live casinos, the, the ante is a little bit bigger, or a little bit smaller, depending on the exact scenario. But essentially, when there's more money in the pot, for whatever reason, you have to fight harder. So when the ante happens to be bigger, you in turn should be playing looser ranges. A very clear example of this is whenever you're playing online with, let's say, five players, the ante may only be... 0.15 big blinds per person, which would be 0.75 big blinds total. But when you're playing five-handed in a live tournament with a one big blind ante, that would be one big blind, right? So the ante is bigger in live poker in that scenario. Consider three-handed, right? If you're playing 0.15 big blinds per person online, that's only 0.45 big blinds. Whereas if you're playing live and you have a big blind ante, the ante is over twice the size, right? And that will impact your strategy. We actually have charts on pokercoaching.com that very clearly show the differences in the strategic adjustments you should be making. Next, you need to let your raise sizes reflect your situation. Whenever you're at a final table, very rarely should you just default to minimum raising or raising a 2.2 big blinds with everything. When you have to play very tight, you typically want to bet using a larger size. And when you're playing looser, you typically want to play using a smaller size. Also, at a final table, blockers, an ace or a king, especially an ace though, go way up in value because you want to disincentivize action. And because of this, we're going to see small pairs and low-suited connectors go way down in value whenever you're playing at a final table. And we're going to see ace X, even offsuit sometimes, go way up in value. Also, if you don't want to bust, don't get it all in. Very often, if you look at game theory optimal charts, you'll see scenarios where if someone raises and you have 25 big blinds and you have ace-10 offsuit, you just put the money in. Not at a final table. Very often at a final table, you are better off re-raising small with hands like ace-10 offsuit, as well as some super nuts that can call it off. And then you're going to fold if you get shoved on. And it may feel quite annoying to raise and then fold off the ace-10, but if your opponent knows your range is balanced and they still want to put their money in, not in good shape and you're probably dominated and you really 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 don't want to get it all in in a roughly flipping scenario or especially a scenario where you're dominated at a final table so you can raise fold a little bit more often understand that everyone is not aware of payout implications some players have not studied final table strategy at all they're just oblivious other players just 
came to play to win. They want to win a trophy. Maybe because they don't have any or maybe because they're addicted to winning trophies. Other players will blind out because they really care about moving up the payouts. One time at a final table that I played that I actually won, I got word that one of the players at the table really needed to take fourth place money so that he could pay off his house. He made this clear to everyone. He was like, yeah, if I take fourth, I can pay off my house. Well, I pushed that player around a ton when there are were six players and five players remaining. And then once four players remained, I raised with something like ace-10. He ripped it all in for the first time at the final table. I called with the ace-10 because I thought, you know, now he's free rolling. I think he had like jack-7 or something like that. And the commentators were like, oh my gosh, how can he call this guy who hasn't played a hand with the ace-10 offsuit? But... Had a little bit of inside information here, right? That player was playing really, really tightly because they really wanted to, to move up the payouts. And once they did, they're going to go nuts. So understand that your opponent's strategy is vitally important. You always want to be aware of what your opponents are doing incorrectly and adjust accordingly. You're going to find also that many players, not just bad players, but many players overvalue strong hands, hands that are typically very good when you're playing normal poker with no payout implications or relatively small payout implications. But a lot of these hands go down in value when you're playing with substantial payout implications. And especially as a big stack or medium stack, when you can make a lot of money by folding, because you're going to fold this hand and a lot of future hands, when you're facing a substantial bet for all of your money or most of your money, you need to call off really tightly. There's this idea of risk premium that we discussed thoroughly in my tournament master class that we're not going to discuss here today. But essentially, as the amount of money you are risking is more and more valuable, because your stack is worth a large chunk of money, and you don't want to just put it in in a roughly neutral spot, you need to call off tighter and tighter and tighter to the point that sometimes if you have two big stacks against each other at a final table battling, they should perhaps call off for like aces and kings only, which again, sounds super nitty, but it is very often the ideal play. You may ask, well, shouldn't the opponent just try to run the other big stack over? And the answer is no, because sometimes they're going to have aces and kings. And whenever you run some nonsense into aces or kings and you bust, it's an absolute disaster. Um, this concept's going to be even more magnified as multiple short stacks are at the final table. I mean, consider what happens when there are two 30 big blind stacks and four five big blind stacks. All those five big blind stacks are kind of likely to outlast two or three of the other short stacks as they just hang out. So the 30 big blind stacks can run these players over. What if one of the 30 big blind stacks has 50 instead? Well, now the 50 big blind stack can run everybody over because the 30 big blind stack is close to guaranteed to take second place or third place, maybe, if they just sit there and fold for like 30 minutes or an hour. So that 30 big blind stack just has to sit there and be super duper tight. So this often results in hands like pocket tens, ace king, that are normally really, really good, needing to be folded when a ton of money is going in before the flop. And you have to call off for all your stack when there are short stacks at the final table. And this is definitely true for hands like ace jack suited and pocket eights. Hands that you can normally get it in, no problem for like 20 or 30 big blinds, but definitely not when you are at a final table and there are big payout implications. When you do have one of these hands, that really does not want to make a raise and then call off, you're going to find that sometimes it's better just to rip it all in, even for a decent amount of chips, because that is better than raising and then getting shoved on, because then you have to call off in a roughly neutral spot. Finally, keep in mind that some big stacks are lunatics. A lot of big stacks think it's their job to bust the short stacks, but in reality, the big stacks should not mind the short stacks being at the table, because when the short stacks are at the table, they get to push around all the medium stacks. So definitely keep that in mind. Some big stacks are just going to call it off super wide. They're going to be torching their money and everybody else's who gets involved with them. So maybe it makes sense to really shy away from those players. If you are playing as someone who is raising very, very frequently, you're going to want to go all in for between, let's say, 15 and 30 big blinds with pretty loose ranges, because if you do, if they raise with all sorts of nonsense, and then you jam for a decently big stack that they're not just going to call off with with a 9-8 suited or whatever, you're going to be able to pick up a lot of small pots with relatively little risk. Also, I cannot make this any more clear, you have to be cautious in final table scenarios, and if multiple players are playing aggressively in a pot, you really, really, really need to tighten up because one of them's likely to bust each other, and they both probably have pretty good ranges. 
All right, let's take a look at some preflop examples using the poker coaching website. Here we have ICM charts, which are charts with payout applications. We selected with a one big blind ante. This is when we are playing in a live cat in a live tournament. We have three-way charts and five-way charts here. We are always uploading more. Let's just take a look at some common spots. Here we have the stack distribution. We have the low uh, hijack on the left, cutoff next to that, button in the middle, small blind, and then big blind. Let's take a look at a scenario where we're going to show very clearly this scenario here where the hijack has 20 big blinds. I messed up my chart here. The hijack has 20 big blinds. The cutoff has 30. The button has 60. And the small blind has 15 and the big blind has 44. Give it a second. It'll load up in just a second. Here we go. Okay. The under the gun player, which is the hijack, with 20 big blinds, has to play very, very tightly. This is their range in the scenario. As you see, hands like pocket fives just folds. Ace two suited folds. May seem nitty. Notice all the suited connectors are terrible, right? We actually show how much you lose by playing these hands. So this is a spot where you just have to fold. You must fold in this scenario with all of these marginal suited hands. Okay, so let's say this player folds. We just click fold here. Now it's gonna move the cutoff over. Here's what the cutoff should play. The cutoff is also pretty uh, medium stacked, right? They have 30 big blinds. Notice there's a 15 big blind behind. Normally the cutoff would raise far wider than this. Notice the cutoff in a scenario with no pound implications would, would raise more suited connectors, more small pairs, perhaps more suited hands up in this region. But because there are payout implications and they have a big stack with 60 big blinds on their left, this is a spot where they play pretty tightly. Let's say they fold. Here we have the buttons raising range. They are raising with 63% of hands or so. Is that right? Maybe right. Um, this is a scenario where notice now they get to raise wider than if there are no payout implications. Because they have 60 big blinds, and the other two players yet to act have to be a little bit tight, right? So that allows these players with a big stack to raise with a wider range than they normally would if there were no payout implications. And then if this player folds, here's what the small blind should do. With 15 big blinds and the small blind, we see a very mixed strategy. Notice, we do have a lot of raised folds, which you may not necessarily see with some of these junky hands. If we are playing with no payout implications, like a lot of King X offsuit, which is raise and then fold. Same thing for hands like Queen 9, Queen 8, etc. And we have a lot of open shoves with a lot of Ace X. Notice every Ace X is shoving, lots of suited connected hands, lots of small pairs, etc. Uh, let's go back to what happens when the cutoff folds and the button min raises. We can click this button right here. And now this will show what the small blind should do. Notice here with 15 big blinds, small blinds basically all in or folding. Unless, however, they have aces, kings, or ace, king suited. And in that scenario, they are going to re-raise small. I realize these colors and sizes may be a little bit diff difficult to see, but you should re-raise tiny with aces, kings, ace, king suited, and then a smattering of ace, x offsuit, like ace, six offsuit, ace, seven offsuit, ace, three offsuit, with the idea that you're going to re-raise those and then fold if you get jammed. Okay? Now, let me show you something else. Let's say the small blind folds, and now it's over to the big blind. Button raises, and you're in the big blind. Normally, you should be three betting a pretty large chunk of your best hands, some suited connected type stuff, some suited hands in general, maybe a few blockers, etc. But take a look at this three betting range now. The three betting range, the hands in light red, are literally aces, kings, and ace, king suited for the 45, a 44 big blind stack. So to be clear, stacks are 20, 30, 60 on the button, 15 in the small blind, 44 on in the big blind. When the big stack raises and you are at risk of going broke, you have to play super duper tight. Super duper tight. And you'll notice a lot of the bluffs are going to come from random ace x, king x hands, plus a few suited connectors in this instance. And that's only because we're playing 40 something big blinds deep. Um, but lot, a, a decent amount of calling. I will say you're going to call tighter than if there are no payout implications. But this is a situation where you have to be really, really tight facing that raise. Let's see if we can find another example of this concept. Let's look at this chart here. Here we have 60 big blinds in the hijack, 30 in the cutoff, 15 
in the or on the button, 45 in the small blind, 20 in the big blind. And let's presume under the gun, the big stack raises. So they raise. Now you're going to see the cutoff with 30 big blinds has to play incredibly tightly. And they don't get to call very much at all. And the reason they have to be so tight is because the button has 15 and the big blind has 20 and this player in the cutoff has 30, right? So this is a spot where you're just basically three betting everything. And uh, you're not three betting all in. And the reason you're not three betting all in, let's see if I can actually click this here. Will this give me the response for the under the gun player? It does. Notice that in this scenario, because your range contains a lot of nut hands, you actually put your opponent in a pretty tough spot. So if you look at the under the gun shoving range, though, notice it's really weird looking. We're re-raising tiny again with the nuts plus some King X suited bluffs. Does anybody do this? I don't know. The best people in the world do. Um, it's hard to know these scenarios. Notice, though, jams with ASEC suited. Let's say they do go all in. And now this is going to show us what the cutoff should call off with. Take a look at this. So let's make it clear. The hijack makes it two big blinds or something like that. The cutoff re-raise is small. By the way, you are going to be using smaller re-raise sizes most of the time at the final table. If you get jammed on, and I just showed you the jamming range, it's, it's, a, it's a bunch of ace-x suited and middle pairs. This is all you can call off with. Aces, kings, queens, jacks, tens, ace, king, and ace, queen suited. That seems incredibly tight, right? And you may look at this and say, wow, we're folding a ton of our range. And yeah, we are. The problem is, is that for the opponent, it's just detrimental when they run into our the top of our range, which lets us raise and then fold hands like pocket eights, ace-10 suited, ace-queen offsuit that perhaps we would normally consider calling off. Okay, let's go back to this. Let's presume under the gun men raises. Now let's say the cutoff folds. Now the button with 15 big blinds. This is pretty logical. I think they're going to be mostly all in or fold because they have only 15 big blinds. Fine, let's say they fold. Now, small blind with 44 big blinds. Interesting spot for them. Notice they have to be quite tight. They don't get a splash with any suited connected hands, marginal big cards. They just have to fold those. Also notice you're, they're not even three betting with a lot of their best hands. It would normally three bets, eight, uh, kings, queens, jacks, ace, queen suited, etc. So again, they have to play a lot tighter. Notice though, some of the hands that really like to three bet in this scenario are a lot of the ace x suited, king x suited, ace king off, or ace x offsuit, and king x offsuit. These hands heavily prefer well, they, they prefer three betting more than they would if there were no payout implications. So definitely keep that in mind. Also knows a lot of marginal suited connected hands just have to fold. Let's presume they fold. Now we're to the big blind with 20 big blinds. Look at this wild chart. You should know if you studied with no payout implications, when you're playing at a final table, I'm sorry, when you're not playing at a final table and somebody raises, you should be defending your big blind really, really wide when you have 20 big blinds because you can call, flop a pair, load your money in, easy game. But... That is not the case when you're playing at a final table because, again, you really don't want to get it in in marginal spots. And when you do defend with the king four offsuit and you plop a pair of kings or even a pair of fours and you get it all in and your opponent calls, it's not good, right? It's marginal. So look at this bizarre range. Again, this is something almost no one does or even knows. Uh, notice this, the pairs are all shoving, which makes sense. Good ace X is shoving, which makes sense. The best suited high card hands make sense. Ace X suited makes sense. But look at these kind of... Seemingly random suited, connected, queens, jacks, and 10-9 suited. Almost no one jams those, and that's a mistake. This is why you have to study these scenarios a ton to figure out general rules and heuristics for common scenarios you're likely to be in. All right, let's go back to... Um, same scenario, but let's now presume under the gun folds, okay? Big stack folds. Notice, by the way, the big stack is raising quite wide, but not any two cards. Some big stacks think they're supposed to raise any two cards. That is definitely not the case. Let's presume the cutoff with 30 big blinds is in this scenario. Notice again, 30 big blinds deep. They're still folding out small pairs and basically every suited connector. Hands like 8-7 suited are just bad. <laughs> they're just bad in this spot. So let's presume they fold. Now we're to the button with 15 big blinds. This is a spot where I think the shoving range is pretty logical. They are men raising with a very polarized range, right? This makes a lot of sense. They're men raising sevens and better, ace eight suited and better. They're men raising a bunch of junk, mostly with blockers again. Notice eight seven suited, seven six suited, six five suited are not playable. Let's say they fold. And now take a look at this small blind strategy. This is when the small blind has 45 big blinds and the big blind has 20, okay? 
Small blind has 45, big blind has 20, and there's a 15 big blind stack at the table. Look at how wide this all-in range is. This is a ridiculously wide all-in range, consisting with a ton of suited hands, ace-x blockers, king-x blockers, queen-x blockers, jack-x blockers, 10-x blockers. Super, super, super duper wide all-in strategy in this scenario because the big blind has to be very, very tight. We can magnify this even more. Let's take a look at this scenario here. We have 25 in the hijack, 30 on the cutoff, 10 on the button, 40 in the small blind, 15 in the big blind. I can already tell you, whenever they fold around to the small blind here, they are going to be playing hyper-aggressive because they have 40, the big blind has 15, and there's a 10 big blind stack. So now, under the gun with 25 has to be very tight. Cut off and with, uh, with 30 big blinds. Because there's a 40 big blind stack and the small blind has to be a little bit tighter, but not like insane tight because they are going to be in position. Button now, let's presume the button with 10 big blind folds. Take a look at the strategy for the small blind with 40 big blinds now. So this may seem very similar to the previous scenario where it's 45 in the small blind, 20 in the big blind, but now it's 40 in the small blind, 15 in the big blind. So the stacks are slightly shorter and there is a shorter short stack. And now we see the small blind should be folding basically never, only the absolute garbage, and they should be jamming with a ton of hands. Again, men raising or raising small, very polarized, right? They're raising very polarized with the best hands plus a smatter of absolute trash. Cool to see. Um, let's also take a look at what happens when, same scenario, we're going to look at when under the gun folds, cutoff folds, and now let's say the button goes all in. Should the 15 big blind stack call off tighter or wider compared to if there are no payout implications? Well, in this scenario, they're going to have to be quite tight for calling off 10 big blinds. And the reason the big blind has to be quite tight calling off for 10 big blinds here is because if they call and lose, now they're down to five big blinds and they're going to be in a really, really bad spot. So... You would certainly call off a little bit wider than this if there were no payout implications, but with payout implications, you just got to be a little bit tight. Got to knit it up a little bit. It's annoying, but it is what it is. Let's take a look at one more. Now we have 10 big blinds under the gun, or in the hijack, 20 in the cutoff, 30 on the button, 15 in the small blind, 50 in the big blind. This is when we have a big stack in the big blind. Again, notice, still min raising or folding. We discussed this point, right? Hands like ace nine offsuit, king jack offsuit, et cetera, are min raising and then folding for 10 big blinds because you really, really, really don't want to be dominated. And notice the min raising range is protected by super duper nuts, right? So with 10 big blinds, you can still min raise fold at the final table. It is not all in or fold, everyone. It is not all in or fold. If you're using an all in or fold chart, you are torching your money. Please don't torch your money. Everyone in this scenario is going to have to be tighter because we have 10, 20, 30, 15, and then 50 in the big blind. The 50 big blind, big stack, forces everyone else to be much tighter. So we see the cutoff. They have to be quite tight. 20 big blind stack, even 30 big blinds on the button. Notice they are playing super duper tight. Fours, threes, twos folding, ace x folding, king x folding, right? Like lots and lots of folds. All the pseudo connectives obviously folding. We've already figured out that. You gotta be really, really tight. Notice the hands that do still play are usually the ace x and the king x suiteds and perhaps some ace x blockers. All right? If the Action folds to the small blind. Now we see the small blind actually doesn't get to limp much at all, which is kind of neat to see. So why does the small blind with 15 big blinds not get to limp much at all? Whereas, you know, with no pound implication, small blind gets to limp a lot because they're getting very good odds, right? In this scenario, yeah, they're still getting great odds. The problem, though, is that if they limp, they're just going to get jammed on a ton. Now, they're actually not going to get jammed on a ton if they limp with this range because their limping range is going to be decently protected. But if you limp too wide in this scenario with just a lot of marginal stuff, all the big stack has to do is rip it in on you and you have to fold because there's a 10 big blind stack at the table. And that's going to result in you getting crushed. So again, always consider what your opponents do wrong. If they're playing with just GTO charts and they think they're supposed to limp with a bunch of marginal stuff, plus some nuts still, when they limp, raise them. And if they have garbage, they're going to fold. And if they don't, well, you can fold if you didn't go all in. Notice also, a pretty wide all-in range for 15 big blinds in this scenario, which is perhaps going to be uncomfortable for some people. It folds to you. You're just in with any ace for 15 big blinds, 10-9 offsuit, 10-9 uh, suited, 7-6 suited, etc. Cool spot. And this kind of thing comes up over and over and over again. 
Again, these charts are available in pokercoaching.com. We're getting them added to our app soon, but it's a very good resource for studying common scenarios. We also have uh, a bunch of three-handed scenarios lined up as well, and we have scenarios lined up such that the ante is smaller, so check that out. And we're constantly adding more scenarios so that we can always continue studying. We have not uh, noticed so far, this video is getting kind of long, we have not discussed post-flop at all. Maybe we'll make another video in the future. If you want to see another video on post-flop final table scenarios, let me know in the comment section below. Understand, though, the same concepts as before still apply. You want to consider who gets to apply pressure on the other players because that's going to dictate post-flop aggression heavily. Typically, you do not want to play huge pots when there are payout implication pressure. So when that is the case, which is usually going to be the case when you're not in the big stack, your bet sizes should reflect that and move down. This is why you see a lot of the best players in the world using one big blind continuation flop bets in a lot of scenarios post-flop at final tables when they are the short stack because they are trying to not get all in. They have a range advantage. They even have a nut advantage, but they don't want to play for all the money. So keep that in mind. So when you are the one who is able to apply a lot of pressure, you're usually going to be betting. Often using a small amount, you again, you don't need to like load money into the pot um, unless you are in a scenario where you can make your range very polarized. But when you're not the big stack, you're going to be super passive. So as the big stack, this is going to result in more check raising, more leading. Say medium stack raises, you call the big blind and it comes seven, six, four, a board that's normally really good for the big blind. Maybe you don't want to be leading when you have 50 big blinds in this scenario normally and your opponent has 40 because you're a little too deep stacked. But in this scenario at a final table, maybe you can just bet and start loading money into the pot. Again, we're not going to get into all of that today, but essentially big stacks get to put money in the pot because of the concept of risk premium, which we discuss again in the advanced tournament course and tournament masterclass of poker coaching. And that forces the shorter stack to need to have a whole lot more equity in order to continue, which results in them folding far more often than they would otherwise. And this gives the big stack a very nice advantage at the final table because it lets them slowly chip up as long as they're not insane and just loading their money into every single pot. That's gonna be it for today. If you enjoyed today's video, do me a favor, click the like and subscribe button below to make the final table. I hope you crush it. I hope you use some of these tips to help you. Make sure you check out all the resources we have available for you. Good luck in your games. Have fun. And when you make the final table, I hope you run super duper hot. Talk to you next time.